Sam's, uh, we call it Sam's new to me. You guys know why you're out here? No. No? No one has any ideas? We officially opened it last year, or this October, Sam's Nunami, means out on the land. It's for all grades, but for the one to threes, it might be a little bit too far for them, like in the winter time, and they might get a little bit too cold. So we really target like the four, fives, and six. You guys got to come out here is to give you a little bit of break from school. And you know, Mr. Dean and Mr. Connell spend quite a bit of time sometimes with some of you down in the office. For what reasons? Mm -hmm. Garden keeper? Mm -hmm. You made a what? Oh. You made a mistake. Yep. Okay? We all make mistakes. But the other things we want to talk about is the, our beliefs. What are our three beliefs at school? Safety. Well, the, what's the most important one that we safety. talk? Number one, safety. safety. What are some things out here in the bush that you have to be uh, cautious of or always watch for safety? Damien, one Stay at a time. Staying in a group. Staying in a group, yes. Ne never wander off is what I think Damien's saying. Okay, someone else. We're talking about safety here. Some Logan? Okay, don't run around. That's a prime example. Don't run around the stove or don't be pushing around the stove. Don't. Yeah, well, that's, that's being safe. How about when you're in the, on the skidoo or in the toboggan? Second thing is our belief at school and out here is what? Respect. Is respect. respect. Give me examples of how you can be respectful. Simon. Don't talk back. Don't talk back's one way. Uh, Logan. There are three beliefs that we feel if those students follow them, they're going to be successful in the school and in life. So our three beliefs in the school are that everybody has uh, the right to be safe and feel safe. Everybody has the right to be respected and to be respectful. And everybody comes to school to learn. So we, we set up three beliefs as our foundations for the school. Some of them, it's the first time for the kids to come out and experience this. Even looking for dry wood, you know, and starting a fire. Some of the kids, they didn't know how to put wood in the fire because they didn't know what kind of wood to look for. So we showed them what kind of dry wood to look for, and it was really good. Huh? What do you got to do to start a fire? Mm. First, you put in the wood, small wood first. Small wood first? Mm-hmm. Put it in big pile. Birch is really good for teas. And birch? also it goes to salad. Why is birch good? Huh? Because it burns fat. Also bees are good. And smoke. Uh, it's a hot dog cook-off. In the evening, they can run around and play in the snow. It's so good for them. I think the way it benefits them is they're out in the outdoors, the fresh air. It gets them away from video games. It gets them away from their Xbox, from uh, computer, from their iPods, from the cell phone, from the TV. And they're out here and they play games and they absolutely love it. Like this, and then now close your eyes and, and try to hold it in and come out like in a big circle. The big thing with these uh, these trips is to identify at-risk kids, try and get them to be interested in school. Some of the kids who may be low attenders or who may have behavior issues are coming to school for these kind of things and you know are, are wanting to come more. These kids who may struggle in the school academically or socially. A lot of times you take them out on the land and they're the strongest kids out there. Um, they, uh, they excel and it's an opportunity for a, a book smart student to, to go out on the land and be taught by a student who may not be as strong academically but out in the bush they've spent quite a bit of time. So a lot of it's dealing with uh, you know trying to get them here, trying to get them interested but also it's working on self-esteem. Uh, and these students who are at risk, you take them on the land, this is their opportunity to shine and, and feel proud of themselves. The, at our school at Sam's, this is our big The is girls The girls tent? They Ooh, slept on ladies! There. They slept on there and kept their fire on all night. And, then, and this it's is boiling. This is the boys tent we slept up there. And we, and we kept the fire on all night. This is boiling. 
that's this stove that we kept the fire on all night. Come on. This is the storage for all of the storage What do you? What kind of stuff do you keep in here? We keep the saws and uh, we keep our food in here. We keep the axes in here Generator. and all the stuff we need to build the tent. This is the This is the outhouse. Nice and clean. Outhouse. And smell free. <laughs> The big thing of, of doing these kind of things is to incorporate culture, is to try and instill pride in culture and heritage in the kids. Uh, it's always great to have a local person there that has a lot more experience than I do, knows the land here, and uh, the kids can hear from them and see uh, from an expert. When my kids were younger, I said, you know, the trapping industry is dying. It's a dying art. It's a dying tradition. With my generation, I said, I, I don't want this, our, our tradition, our culture to die with me. So I said, I'm, I got to pass this along. I wanted to pass my knowledge on to, to, to the next generation. And then with the schools coming along, I said, this is a great opportunity. And at that age, they're, they're 11 or 12 years old, 13, some of them. And they're, at that age, they're really impressionable. Huh? They're, they're just, they just want to soak in that knowledge. Trapping season begins November 1st, and it ends March 31st. And so, one of the places that I, I like to set the um, fox traps is, is right on my, my skidoo trail. This is actually kind of a, a trapper's pose. Down on one knee, and um, and your hand is like that, and you press really hard down on this trap right here. And this one is actually, your fingers are right here, your thumb is right here. Press it down, spread it open. And then you hold it like this. You notice that I got one finger there, and my thumb is holding the jaws apart. And then you put this catcher here over over one jaw hold it right in front of the spoon lift it on and then you let this thumb go and you're holding this together like this then you grab the spring slowly release the spoon down and this is the kind of toggle I like it's a Y stick and it's green Good for it's, marshmallows. It, it's really strong, eh? <laughs> Can you put it in like this? It will never come off. Even if you're dragging it along, it wouldn't come off. In order for you to anchor it down, you need to get tension your your skidoo trail. Dig it out a little bit. And you put your your toggle in there. Then you cover it in with the snow that you dug out. You put your bait under this, right where you're going to set your trap. Set it in place like that. Make sure your chain is not really visible. And I, I usually carry a, a Ziploc bag of Kleenex. And you put it over the spoon like that. Camouflage as best you can. It's, it's really effective. Fox will come along and, and he's melt something under there. There's good smelling food under there. He uses bait. So he starts to dig along. <laughs> and he's caught. Okay, guys. Did you have fun trapping this afternoon? Yeah, it was what? really fun. I learned that. It takes a long time to learn it and it's pretty difficult and it seems pretty fun to trap all the animals that you can eat that you catch. And get ready to open the jaws. How did I show you? Yeah. Okay, press it hard, open it, hold it really hard. Don't let it snap on you. Okay, hold it really hard. Take this one off. Put this up. This 
there and then Caroline grab it. Done by now. Grab it there. Okay, Is now. Okay, hold it like that. Now hold this one. <laughs> okay, let it go slowly. Release this whole hand. Grab it by the spring now. The spring is this. Yeah. Okay, slowly release that. There you go. Oh, oh. Wow. We're heading back to your new week. See the water dripping on there? That means it's, it's active. When they use the, the, the side that they use is really smooth up top here. Just from constant use in their body heat. And it just gets totally glass smooth on, on top there. But they got a good sitting platform here. You want it to make that uh, uh, just wide enough so that the trap will sit in there properly and not wiggling around or so you try to chisel it make it as smooth as you can on the sitting platform there's a really nice concave or convex thing in there and um, you try to find out oh yeah this is the middle of the of the the curvature there and so you give it a Try to fix it up as best you can. And then you clean it out. You just scoop out that all that snow that you just finished chiseling. So you set your trap, give it a little angle like that. It it, it sets like if it was straight, this this don't set right, huh? So I always give it a little angle and then it settles down right there. And then I give this a push and it pushes the spoon down further. See, you notice, you see it going down? I don't know, that's what I've always done. If you just set this in there and close it up and the muskrat gets caught, he's gonna take off down the hole with the trap. So you all have gotta anchor it down. And this is called toggle. And you just put it on the side of the hole that you made if you want to anchor it down with some snow, you can. Put, put your trap in. And as soon as it starts to curve down, you pull it back just a tad. And then you anchor it in with a bunch of snow like that. In the past, we that's all we used uh, was this stuff. Because it doesn't melt and it doesn't cave in. So we always use this stuff. Then you just cover it up. It's just for conservation purposes. Conservation means that you don't want to harvest this lake until there's no more muskrats in this lake and you're over harvesting. And that wasn't the way my ancestors did it long ago. And so after about three or four days, we would come back to the trap and we would pull it out and move on to another lake and trap that lake for another three days. And there's, I mean, you, you, you do this all day. You, you set your traps all day. You take 20, 30 traps. You look, you look for good push-ups and you stay out all day. You, you, you pack a lunch box and and you, after you finish setting your last trap, you make a fire and have a good campfire tea and sit around for an hour, two hours. And then on the way back home, you you check the chains. We call it checking the chains. All we do is we just uh, dig on the side of the stick like this and we find where the chain is. And then we give it a little tug. And then if it, it pulls back in, that means you caught something without taking it apart. So that's what we, we always did ever since I could remember.
reason we do these programs is to try and uh, increase attendance at school, is tr try and get some of these students who are at risk interested in school. Uh, let them see that school can be fun. They can learn through different styles, whether it's on the land or whether it's hands-on in the shop. Uh, but to give them a variety of different experiences. If we talk about tennis, we talk about academics. If we can get the kids to school more often, they're obviously going to learn. Um, and you know, the, the big part of the attendance and academics is connecting with these students, is uh, spending some one-on-one -on -one time with them. Um, when it's man voice like this, that's when they're really cutting the steel. Well, whether I'm bragging or not, I know I make the best hooks in Delta. <laughs> and that uh, it's, they got to go a long ways before they can put my hook down. But. Oh, so basically now you're passing on what, what yeah, he taught you? I pass it on to the students here. Everyone watching me how I hold my fire? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I grind them all, shape them, and all they had to do was level, smoothen them. But that gives them the idea what they're supposed to do, how the hook's supposed to look, eh? Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm or, uh, I teach them for. But they do a real good job. They, they try their best. Yeah, they, they, really do, they really do a good job. Almost as, some of them are almost as good as the ones I make for myself. Well, when I see them just about finished, like what we're doing now, I see their work and it, you know, I know it's perfect and just me feel like to teach more, you know. Well, I know they enjoyed it. They, they, I didn't have to coax any of them to do the work, which is very good. A lot of it deals with connecting with the students and uh, I know you know this by just going out with the kids, you spend quite a bit of time with them and it's an opportunity for you to connect in, in something that's positive. And I guess that's any human being in general, like I mean if, if you don't feel connected to someone you're not going to really open up to them and you're not going to respond to them. So. And that's something that we've really worked on this year with those kids and just to get a connection with them to, to really work with them. Yeah. The hook is complete. Yours? This is what the jiggle and stick will look like. Find it, then you can dig a hole, and then you can jiggle it. Are you hoping you're going to catch a lot of fish with it? here to see the pangos and then um, we're staying here for one day at the school and then we're going back to Anuba. I didn't know there was that kind of big pangos. I didn't even know what was pangos at first. I know all about them. I don't know I just know that that pingo over there is the second largest pingo in the world. Well, there's a lake, and then when the lake dries up, there's wet soil, and 
um, when it gets cold, <laughs> the wet so I mean the water turns to ice, and then the wet soil starts to dry, and the it starts pushing together, okay. and the ice goes up and it stretches the ground like um, it's pressure, so the ice is going up, and that's how pingos get bigger. Yeah, because the ground stretches. If if people drive on the pingos, wherever they drive, it like might they tear up the ground, and it might melt the ice that's under the ground because the ground is like a blanket for the ice to keep it from melting. Okay. And um, if somebody tears up all the ice with the skidoo, then it's gonna start melting, and then the pingos gonna get smaller. We feel that if we can install knowledge into them about the pingos, it'll create a sense of pride. And we feel that if someone has pride in our pingos, they will work to protect and take care of them um, for future generations. So all in all, we're talking about ecological integrity, the animals that use the pingo, um, the vegetation around the pingo. Um, we've conducted that into a few games. So the first game that we're gonna play is called Fox and Bulls. So the bull's like a little, Lemming or a mouse. There's a whole bunch of tunnels underneath places among there that you don't see because they're under the ground. And the foxes like to eat the bulls. All right, that's what they do. So if you can't see something, you can't smell them because they're under the soil, what other sense would you use? You gotta be really quiet. You hear them scurry. And then as soon as the fox hears them scurry, he pounces on them. Habitat. Oh, you got oh, another bowl. Okay, one more bowl left. Ready, go! Six, six, Just run! Six, six, they have basic needs. Water, food, and shelter. So for birds migrating from southern United States and coming all the way to northern Canada, they're going to come across a lot of elements. What are some of the hazards, what are some hazards that this, these birds might encounter? Acid rain. Hunters. Predators. Predators. Power poles. Storms. Pollution. Pollution. Turbine. Oh, oh. oh, oh.